now. So we are good to go. Um, a huge thank you to people who are watching this back and to people who have tuned in live. Um, so this is the first of a week of Saboteur Awards Festival events. Um, you can find um, all of the others listed on our website. Um, we have poetry shows and anthology launches. We have quite a few pre-records going up um, over the week as well. So lots of fun things happening between now and Saturday. Saturday being when all of our Sparkly winners will be announced all over the internet. Um, and and that, that is kind of what the rest of the week looks like for Sabotage. But for this evening, um, I am joined by esteemed guests and welcome speakers. Um, and I will hand over to Isabel Kenyon from Fly on the Wall Press to kickstart the event. Cool, cheers, Charlie. Uh, so what we wanted to do first, uh, so today we are launching a book which Saboteur Awards and Sabotage Reviews put together with Fly on the Wall Press. Uh, it is called in conversation with small press publishers and it features some of the best UK small presses who are doing innovative and groundbreaking works which perhaps you might not see uh, in the big top 10. Uh, so we wanted to interview them as Hayley is, is uh, modelling for us. Um, we wanted to interview them and um, put together a resource for people that want a more personalised experience when they're working with a publisher. So we thought it'd be lovely to chat to two of the publishing houses that we have within the book and obviously Charlie herself. Um, and so I would like to first introduce our first panelist, which is of course, Dr. Charlie Barnes. So Dr. Charlie Barnes is an academic and an author from the West Midlands. She's an author of several poetry publications, including Law, which Flowers, Folklore and Footnotes, which is Black Pear Press, and that was in 2021 this year. And she's also authored three short fiction releases, including Go on a Road Trip with Wild Press Books. And under Charlotte Barnes, Charlie writes crime fiction, and that includes titles such as Intention, The Copycats, The Watcher, and The Cutter, which are with Bloodhound Books. And that's from 2019 to this year. So she's got a wide range of small press publishing experience. And naturally, she is the managing director of Sabotage Reviews, and she's a lecturer in creative writing and professional writing at the University of Wolverhampton. And as modelled earlier, uh, she has this year got a really cute dog to join her team um, for all her endeavours. <laughs> I feel like Benji deserves the top Benji who is quietly sleeping and I'm wondering how long this can last. Um, I feel like Benji is kind of like PR publicity exec um, with the amount of book promotions he helps me to orchestrate. Um, but what better reason is there for getting a puppy than, than book promotions? Um, so thank you very much, Isabel. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce then my, my co-editor and co-conspirator, um, the wonderful Isabel Kenyon from Fly on the Wall Press. Um, so Isabel Kenyon is a Northern writer and the author of Chatbooks, This Is Not a Spectacle, Digging Holes to Another Continent, both of which are with Claire Songbird's publishing house and Potential, which is with Ghost City Press and Growing Pains with Indigo Dreams Publishing and one short story with Wild Press Books um, called The Town Talks. So Isabel also has extensive experience of working with independent presses. She is also the editor of Fly on the Wall Press, a socially conscious small press for chat books and anthologies. Isabel has had poems and articles published internationally in journals such as Ink, Sweat and Tears and newspapers such as the Somerville Times and the Bookseller. Um, Isabel is also a fierce dog lover um, and self-confessed caffeine addict. Um, so when it came to putting this book together, we had quite a lot to bond over. Um, part of our reason for kind of liaising on this project together was that we felt that we could come at it from a lot of angles both as um, people who had worked on the editorial side of things and authors who had worked with um, independent presses. Um, I um, originally came to this project though from like a slightly more academic um, experience and slightly more academic point of view. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce a, another panelist this evening um, who I have crossed paths with several times over in academia now. Um, so Dr. Jack McGowan uh, is a senior lecturer in creative writing and head of department for English media and culture at the University of Worcester. 
Prior to this, Jack also taught English literature and creative writing at the University of Warwick, where he won a WATE Teaching Excellence Award in 2015. Jack specialises in performance poetry, its place in academic study and how space can be negotiated as part of poetry performance. And he has also researched digital literature and video game narratives, among other academic interests. Jack's publication history boasts uh, poetry featured in the likes of the New Victoria Anthology of Collected Poets and Dove Release, New Flights and Voices, alongside poetry and critical essays published elsewhere. Additionally, Jack has also recently co-edited Spoken Word in the UK alongside Lucy English, uh, and that collection is a comprehensive look and analyses around Spoken Word and its place within the UK, written by academics, critics and performance artists alike. So we are especially, especially glad to have Jack here this evening so he can talk to us about all things academic and tell us how important indie presses are. <laughs> You sound so cool, Jack, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good intro. Um, and in terms of the publishers from the book that we've got here tonight, um, who will be your best bet if you've got burning questions about submission or editing process with small presses, we've got the lovely Hayley Jenkins, who is the founder of Selkoof Station. She's the founder and editor of this small press, which is dedicated to supporting and promoting the work of indie artists, writers, gamers, and other creative entrepreneurs. And they publish themed magazines and they regularly publish writers on their blog. And then they also have pamphlets and collections of poetry and fiction. So they've got quite a, a varied publishing schedule. And we also have the lovely Stairwell Books with us today from York. Um, and I forgot to say Haley's from Surrey. So we've got a lovely uh, wide berth today. And um, so Dr. Rose Drew and Alan Gillett run Stairwell Books. It was founded in 2015 and they're originally actually based in America so Rose and Alan have an experience of publishing in both Yorkshire and the USA which is an interesting mix and they publish a wide range of genres such as novels, poetry, collaborative anthologies, memoir and young adult. We were founded in 2005 actually. Oh I, I saw I read 2005 what did I say Rose sorry. <laughs> I take 10 years off of my age too, so we're, it's okay. We're, we're just... um, so to, to situate the book a little better then for anyone who's not quite familiar with it just yet. Um, so the premise of the book is that uh, Isabel and I really felt that there was space in which, <laughs> wonderfully modelled by Hayley again, um, Isabel and I felt that there was space in which to kind of bring a bit more of a personal approach to mm. presenting publishing houses or small publishing houses because generally speaking you do get a much more personal experience um, which is why many of us have chosen to work with them why I'm sure people in the room have chosen to establish them um, so the idea behind the book then was that we had um, a set of interview questions that went out to our wonderful editors um, and that enabled them to talk about what it was that they wanted from any approaching authors, what it was that they looked for in an ideal manuscript submission, um, essentially how to get in their good graces, um, but also what they could offer writers and what, what writers would hopefully be able to bring to their experience of working to the press. Um, so Isabel and I really looked for a way to essentially start a dialogue with editors because they are very nice people in in our experiences of having worked with them um, and in doing it in an interview format or a Q&A format rather um, it just allowed for a slightly more personal touch than we thought was already kind of out there and available um, and it all came about essentially because I was sick to the back teeth um, of going into universities and being given a creative writing reading list and only seeing the writers and artists yearbook um, as a as a means for getting published and I have so many thoughts and I can see people in the room have so many thoughts um, but it it felt like a huge misrepresentation and very much an underrepresentation of what it was that independent endeavors had to offer as part of the writing community and the and the artistic community broadly 
Um, so I approached Isabel and said, I'd really like to do something with this. And Isabel said, funny you should say that because I sort of already wanted to do something with this as well. So between the two of us, we were able to, to negotiate what what I think at the very least, and I'm sure Isabel Isabel agrees, is actually a very, a very special resource for creative writers, whether you are coming to it as a seasoned veteran or whether you are coming to it kind of 18 months into a creative writing degree and you're not quite sure what to do with your early days manuscripts. Um, so it is now readily available at several university libraries and university bookstores. It's also available at a couple of mainstream libraries and it's absolutely available through the fly on the wall uh, press website which should be your first port of call because support indie presses <laughs> um if there is a message to take away from this book it is that um so that is where the book is currently available from um and i will hand over to to isabel for what comes next as part of all of this yeah, so to kick off the questions, uh, I thought that one person who may be knowledgeable about working with small presses would be Charlie. So I wanted to start first by asking you, Charlie, because I don't think that you've gone down uh, the usual traditional route that I think people, when they have, say, a novel manuscript, uh, they might think that, you know, first they need to look at, say, the top 10 agencies, they need to query, and um, then, they, you know, it's a long process, maybe like five mm -hmm. years. Um, and I feel that for you, you know, you, you had experience with poetry publishers first, then you went into your short stories, and then you went into your novels. Um, and all of those have been with small presses at different levels. So I just wondered for you, um, how that process was, and also, you know, how it how it varies, what the experience has been like across the three genres. Um, I would say kind of a, across the three genres, I feel like I've had quite a span of indie representation um, because I've worked with like the Blacklight Engine Room Press, which is one brilliant minded man um, having having things stapled together by a local printer. But then I've also worked with Bloodtown Books who have like international bestsellers, but they are very much still independent in in kind of like their business ethos and how they run and how they're funded or rather how they're self-funded um so I've had quite a span of experiences but I can honestly say that I've never had a negative one um and I do realize that 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 may well make me quite a lucky author slash poet I realize that that there are independent presses who maybe don't have going rep yep, reputations, but I feel like I hear about that a lot less often than I hear about kind of underrepresentation or misrepresentation in like a in the bigger part of the public publishing industry um, or in the more dominant part of the publishing industry. Um, so for me, I've had quite a, a varied flavor of things, uh, but that's also taught me kind of what I can do as an author versus what a press can do for me, um, what what I should expect a press to do for me, because, uh, do you know, Hayley, I think you've already mentioned you have been at work all day and then you come home and do press stuff for <laughs> press stuff in the evening. So, do you know, in lots of in lots of cases, like you may well find yourself working with an editor who actually isn't just an editor that in the same way that you are a writer slash teacher, they are also an editor slash whatever it is that pays their bills at the end of the month. Um, so I think it gives you, um, I don't know, like a deeper appreciation, I think, for the for the process behind it. And it does feel a lot more personal because you you're negotiating the release of something that's really special to you and subsequently really special to an editor because editors at independent presses don't have the time and money to buy into products that they don't believe will do well. Um, yeah. and and I, I think I think there's kind of like a special artistic intimacy that come that comes about kind of creating that dialogue between between pre indie press and indie author um, and kind of regardless of whether that's been on like a one-to-one -one basis between me and the Blacklight Engine Room or me and um, Betsy Reevely, who's the publishing director at Bloodhound, like I've I've still had someone that I've been able to say, I really need to talk to you about this. And I've had someone be there. And and my understanding is that you you don't necessarily get that in the 
the big glitzy end of of the yeah. publishing industry um uh, which seems like something that's a that's a real shame to miss out on but I also feel like that that message and that experience isn't always passed on to young writers um which I think is a real shame because it would be really nice to have these pleasant intimate experiences straight out the gate rather than be getting rejections from Penguin straight <laughs> straight out the gate um because I you know I certainly know well, I've experienced both and I certainly know which one I appreciate appreciate more as a as a writer and and also as an academic um and I suppose that the academic the academic in me is what makes me so angry is the wrong word passionate <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly um about kind of shedding light on what it's actually like to work with with indie presses because it's a it's really positive like I I have nothing I have nothing but good things to say about it um so yeah so those those are my thoughts on on kind of how the experience varies but how how the important parts of it are actually the same whether your whether your indie publisher is a one-man is a one-man band who staples things together himself or whether there's someone who's you know creating creating internationally renowned crime writers out of out of their publications um oh sorry Isabel no I was just gonna say that it's clear that as well you know you developed a relationship so with Bloodhound Books you started in 2019 yeah. and um, you know you pretty much just working with one person editorially but you know they've believed in you so much that you've got maybe five I may be wrong I'm not counting anymore <laughs> um, novels with five. Blood. <laughs> um, but yeah so I feel like, like uh, working with that one person has enabled them to say right we know Charlie's work and so they can they can sign your next sort of series so it's lovely to see that intimate experience yeah I think it's also a very supportive dynamic as well that you get with with working with someone on like a one-to-one -one level because I I know that I can email Betsy for example and say so I'm being a bit of a tortured artist but I've got a synopsis <laughs> and I don't really know I don't really know how I feel about it and she will say okay could you just email it over <laughs> <laughs> and and it's and it's as simple as that and she will read it as soon as she's got the time to and she will give me feedback as and as and when she can and I I don't know that you would get that with an agent for example who's got 100 writers on their books True. there's pluses and minuses with both I mean if you have the large publishing company they have the funding they have the infrastructure they can market it yeah and we won't have that. We don't have the, the, the funding. We don't have the, the massive, I can't put it on the side of a bus, but you will get us and you will get the, the feedback and you'll also have the, as you've said, the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, a, small, a small company like us, we, we really can't take something that needs a whole lot of work, you know, a bolt of cloth. We'll take the ready-made suit that maybe needs to have the hem taken in and a few buttons added. We'll take things that are a diamond in the rough that I can say, ooh, there is something there. And so that's really important. So we, we um, if someone comes to me and they have something that really needs a lot of work, I'll say, I, I can't. I have edited in the past, um, you know, based on the Society of Authors payment, um, um, guidelines but I actually can't right now we have 20 some odd books that come out a year and we just we're beyond that at this point um I can point people in a direction but yeah there there's both sides to that so I don't have the infrastructure to get you into the booker into the man booker running it that would cost 20 grand you know I had to pull a book from the women's uh first novel prize consideration because it would have broke me it would have cost me 10,000 pounds. And that's a shame because for women to get their first novel, often women and other people will go to the small press because they aren't, it's just harder to get in the door sometimes, isn't it? So, um, but I had to pull it, so I didn't have the money. So there's the pluses and there's the minuses. And uh, it was PayPal Press recently that they won the Costa, I believe, but they had to fundraise the 25 grand. Uh, yes. when you listed. They're like, okay, cool, 25 grand, please. That, that's exactly what it is. And I have to say, I started seeing that book everywhere. I opened the newspaper. I saw the Metro. I did something. There was an ad for the, 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 the Mermaid of Black Pearl. And, and, I, and then I found out, yes, she had crowdfunded for her marketing. And, and that's for really, <laughs> it's you know, all about the money in a way. So what's really important is that you start with something really good 
And then yes, get the word out as best as you can. And then there's a few other parts too. But. <laughs> See, I feel like these these realities don't always like trickle down. Uh, and by that, I mean like we we know these things to be true now because we live and work and write in the industry. Mm. But when you're just starting out, no one sits you down and says, by the way, you're seeing these publishers everywhere because they have all of the money. Yes. And, and that's and that's what enables them to be to be seen everywhere. And I I, I certainly didn't have like a comprehensive understanding of that when I was a creative writing student and and I I do think that there's perhaps space in which that that like the next wave of creative writers wherever they come from uh, should maybe have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about about the practicalities of actually getting work out there and noticed it's, well the getting noticed thing ideally is you go to open mics and start to read a mm -hmm. chapter um a few poems um my authors say what do i do next i said tell everybody go out there go i don't like and then that's the other problem when i when i have an author who i i might not work with it's because they don't want to ever talk about their work they don't read it publicly they don't do this they don't do that and i say sweetie you aren't Lee child you aren't known. We don't know who you are. So you actually have to go out there. And it's your artwork. You've made a painting, so to speak. Be proud of it. And and that is an important part of it. I'd also like just to pipe and say as well, there are, if you are not a person who um, can go to, the, for instance, I, I have stage fright. I can't go to open mics because I literally just clam up like crazy. But what's great about the um, indie publishing industry and, and working with those kind of people is that they can cater it to the author. So if you're, if you're a person who doesn't like being on video, if you're the person who doesn't like um, selling themselves that way, often the indie publisher will talk to you and figure out a way that of publishing and promoting your work that makes you comfortable and doesn't put you in a situation that, that terrifies you. Or you feel like I have to become this person that I'm not. Um, because by nature, we writers like like to hide in like corners, and I mean, I'm not a social person, and you know, there's there's so many other ways of doing it. And when I was at university and getting told, "Oh, you need to go and promote your work at open mics," I'm like, I'm never going to be a writer because I kill. I don't do. I, I don't want to do that. Um, so the, you know, and the wonderful thing about the indie world is that it allows you to be yourself an awful lot more. Um, so anyone who's thinking, oh my God, I have to go do this. There are uh, there's so many different ways you can do it as well. It's fantastic. So I guess the journals and magazines, the individual publications, they become like a, a almost like an open mic, you know, you yeah. appear on these open submission calls and mm. they go, oh, okay, I've heard X poet in these three magazines that I read last month. And then, you know, you might go on to buy the book you know their work is good so i guess you know all podcasts and these sort of things so yeah there's so many forums now that you can have like a, a cv and visually or audio or in person you know you can build it up that way yeah so now we've talked about how wonderful indie presses are i'm gonna put man, man of the hour jack jack mcgowan on the on the spot <laughs> um just because jack obviously you are dealing with creative writing students day in day out um, don't think any of them are here, so you can probably say whatever you want about them. Um, but you are you're dealing with creative writing students all, all the live long day. Um, what part do you think indie publishing does play, can play, should play in creative writing as, as an academic discipline? A big question, obviously. Um, yeah, that's it for the next half an hour. <laughs> Um, obviously, we from the last year we, we've we've become aware of um, not thinking about the foreseeable future too carefully because we don't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. But I think we can pretty confidently say that small press and indie publishing is going to be a massive part of how students progress through a creative writing course and what students think about and read and study. I absolutely agree with you, Charlie. That. There is a, a, a huge paucity and a depressing paucity of kind of access to indie material um, and and signed post sign posting of appropriate uh, presses, which is why texts like this from Fly the Wall is so important that it can be and is 
being put on reading lists across the country. Um, it, I, I suppose it's that sense of visibility that everyone's been talking about, that, that are lacking huge marketing machines and PR and money. It's difficult to put work in front of students. So those opportunities to place work on reading lists to um, inform lecturers about kind of small presses is really important. As it is sort of, if we think about the, I guess the, the aspirational objectives of a creative writing student are to get published, to get their work out into the world, not necessarily even print published if their literary cognitive absorption is not text, it's performance, it's, it's digital media, it's whatever it is, but it's to get their work out into the world. And um, we need venues for students who are more willing, I guess, to take creative risks or to be a bit more innovative in their work because those kinds of projects and books and manuscripts and proposals don't necessarily always get picked up by mainstream publishers. So these it's, it's of fundamental importance in getting as many students as possible to achieve those kinds of aspirations they have at the start of the course, that there are places that they can go and they know, as you guys have been saying, they'll get that personal kind of um, relationship, that experience of being an artist and then doing that necessary part of connecting to the world that is not horrendous enough putting, I guess. So at the risk of kind of like triggering the guillotines, um, which I know is so, something that we, we promised that we wouldn't do, um, or we, we said that we would try very hard not to do. Um, do you think that there's a reason why indie publishing has gone so kind of like un under discussed historically is it is it stigma is it elitism <laughs> we're not on reading lists yeah exactly. i think one of the things one of the things that we've been trying to we have a number of books that would be of interest to academic organizations but what, what we find is a challenge is to get some sort of reasonable marketing list of university libraries it doesn't cost us an arm and a leg to get to get their attend to get their attention. Um, it's it, it, it's it is that difficulty. I think getting the lists um, mm. and the other the other thing is actually making sure that the modules are there in the creative writing courses to make students aware of what's what's around. Um, we do try to offer internships for students, and we've had one or two students who've, who've sort of published either short stories. We've got one book sitting in the in the back back file, um, <clears throat> which was a lovely story, except she then revised it and it uh, wasn't quite as good. <laughs> um, so we, but we we do make that opportunity available to to our interns, both publishing stories or even um, designing book covers. You know, depending on what the what your particular bent is. <laughs> Yep, yeah, I, I I agree with that sense of uh, joined up thinking or joined upness between kind of lecturers who are often the ones responsible for populating reading lists and that awareness of kind of what is out out there. Um, and I know the kind of presses that are represented here have fantastic kind of social media presence and awareness of that kind of visibility, like the importance of visibility. But the thing that is, I guess, simultaneously so rich and beautiful about small press publishing and indie publishing is that there's lots of it going on all over the place and it's these objectives these activities of bringing kind of things together a bit more into one place would I'm sure help with that kind of communication as in terms of the guillotine um, I guess creative creative writing's been taught in some shape or form in since the 70s but it's it's methodological separation its unique identity is not something associated with a, a literature course or a literature syllabus or a literature subject yeah. that's only that's in its infancy really it's kind of course identity and i think the more it kind of kind of grows in that course identity the, the more we will be able to kind of foster like a, a canon that is inclusive of kind of all of the different types of publishing and all of the different, different publishing opportunities that are available um I think East, East Anglia have the, their course includes some sort of um, practical course, practical work, which involves creating a business around your writing. And I know one of our authors has been sort of making a living on it after, after her East Anglia uh, experience. That I, I think is absolutely the way forward there, Alan, that these kind of professionalised 
these modules that teach students that being a writer is a professional identity. It's something not something you just sort of do in your drift through in your spare time if you, if you want to really sort of think about your writing career. Some exposure to that. It's fantastic to hear that there is there are internship opportunities available for students already. We 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 do our best at I guess speaking spokespersoning for universities here. Lots of universities do their best at kind of finding those opportunities for students to have some hands-on experience and those kind of partnerships are really important to how students develop. Yeah, I don't know um, if this is something which I'll be universities do, but one of my, I have a lot of interns on and off and um, one of them was a sort of two year MA at the University of Oxford and they like their university sort of signed me up a little bit, um, which was different because usually people just approach me um, and the university never really checks in with me to say like, you know, is she doing okay? <laughs> um, you know, is she being helpful? Um, well, of course they're being helpful, but um, yeah, it was just interesting to me and it would be nice if universities were more, you know, forward with that. I've seen sometimes that universities are starting to link with small presses, but they, like you were saying, Jack, they're the presses that have been around since the 70s. So even though they're independent, they are very well established. Um, so, yeah, I think we're starting to integrate a little bit more. Um, and as Rose is saying, if you can offer something as a small press to university, then often it's becoming a little bit more integrated. Like I know that Valley Press work with your St. John University to publish an anthology of their work every year. So then they tend to be part of the festivals there, things like that, um, and promoting new writing. So yeah, perhaps it's something like that. It's just that obviously then the small press has to be completely integrated with the ethos of the creative writing course in terms of their, you know, publishing the style and um, specifically the students and working with them in that way. So yeah, it's just probably about becoming completely aligned on what you want to do that year probably long conversations into the future, that kind of thing. We've worked with a series of uh, uh, students who are doing, doing a master's in publication um, from University of Plymouth and also York St. John's. And in 2013, an entire module at York St. John's was, was meshed with, your, uh, with sterile books. And the lecturer that year in 2013 had a book of poetry we're gonna do in a year or two. And he moved it up and the whole class created the book. They designed the cover, they chose the poems, they, um, they ordered the poems, they chose what artwork went where, and um, they designed it, they formatted it, they ordered how many copies they wanted. Uh, we, we called the printing company, we'll, we'll be the final ones on who, how many copies. They did the other part, you know, it's great if you have a book, but you have to get the word out. They created the event. They advertised the event. We sold 85 copies of the book at the book launch. They had the music, they got the venue, they advertised it, which is a lot. So they did all of that. So we did, they were doing that, I guess that was eight, seven or eight years ago, 2013. So it, that's really important. And we've been working with students from uh, York University and York St. John since, since at least 2013. We get several every year, up to six a year. Um, less so this past year because Zoom is exhausting and, and many of our interns just couldn't do the online stuff and, and help us at all. And, and we understood that. So I think it's really important. It shows um, the younger people what's, what is available. It's really good to see someone who goes, yes, I like books, real books, and to encourage that. But yeah, um, we need to get onto reading lists. We actually really, really, really do. We have literary fiction. We have all sorts of things that I'd love to see in the hands of students talking about the themes that are in the books. Yeah, I mean, the number of interns who look at our books and say, this should be on a reading list. This should, I mean, there's three or four which students have begged us, you know, get them on the reading list, but they, they, they don't. But just from what Rose was saying about that project at York St. John's, that same author, just for the bit of joined up here, was the saboteur spoken word performer of the year that, that year. So, you know, it was a, a nice close touch with this, with this, this event. A neat segue back into it. I feel like um, given that I've kind of isolated Jack as the only academic, I should kind of like jump in and offer some, <laughs> offer some defence here. Um, uh, just kind of like speaking from my own experience, obviously at Wolverhampton, which is where I currently teach, and hopefully where I will for some time, um, she, she says, knowing the, knowing the state of flux in, in the arts and academia. Um, so our creative writing programme is actually creative and professional writing. 
and there is uh, which I know is the same uh, kind of at, at Jack's University and there is um, you know like a real heavy lean towards this idea of looking at the industry elements of creative writing um, which I think working with indie presses and being part of indie presses can be really really helpful towards just in terms of giving students like a a greater appreciation of I suppose like the nuts and bolts that goes into actually getting a book out there actually getting a getting a manuscript ready for print and all the rest of it um I'm constantly amazed by the amount of students so say who say things like so you draft a book and then it's done I'm like well, then that draft of the book is done yes <laughs> um, but there are there are subsequent there are subsequent drafts um so it is nice to uh, I suppose kind of like flag up the fact that there are more and more universities and I know that there are a couple that, here that have been mentioned in the comments already um about kind of developing this professionalism and creative industry practice that, that kind of goes goes hand in hand with with creative writing. Um, I feel like we can probably talk about this until the cows come home, and then likely talk to the cows about it too. Um, and I'm conscious of creeping into other people's question time um, because there are, there's so much to talk about when it comes to creative writing and academia and the interplay between that pot of creative writing and the actual practical lifestyle of creative writing. Um, so Isabel, please pop a cork in me because I don't want to don't I'm stealing your time <laughs> basically um we thought what would be really cool as well before we get on to audience questions is asking a little bit about the nitty-gritty of the creative part of the editing and publishing process for small presses so obviously we've got the lovely stairwell books with us today and Selkoop station um so feel free to just answer both of you if you have um thoughts on these which I'm sure you have many thoughts uh, so the first question I have for you is do you feel that you have a responsibility as a small press to publish writing which is not part of the mainstream publishing industry and do you feel that as a small publisher you have a distinctively different audience because of that yes I'd say so um especially with Selkuth because where where Selkuth lies just to do a little quick background is um I'm not an academic. Um, I loved university and I love, and that's how I got into small presses, um, which I won't go into now, we'll be here all night. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do was uh, create a space, uh, primarily community, create a really, foster a really good community um, and also publish work that it wasn't mainstream. It was a bit unusual. A bit different and also affordable um, which is why we love chat books because they are fairly cheap um, not too costly for us to make as well and we can ensure you know we're going to give lots of copies to the writers and we involve them every step of the way including cover design um, we, we love doing that bit because it's like oh we get to make the pretty pictures now um, and so yeah I've always felt very much um, a responsibility to find stuff that pushes it a bit, not necessarily academically, because I know this is going to start a debate. Sometimes I feel academic writing can create another wall because sometimes I can look at something, I'm like, oh, I know this means this and this is linked to that book from that thing, and there's all these sort of philosophies going in. But after a long day work, my brain's not going to function on that that's a weekend read for me um so we wanted to create stuff that wasn't wasn't also too specific in its audience um and I know it varies between press and press as to what audience there is um for us our audience I'd like to think is friendly is open to different things weirdly most of our audience is American and Canadian we get very few English sales <laughs> Um, and I think that's just the, I don't know, it's the nature of, of us, I don't know. Um, or we just seem to pop up more on, on the, the radar over there, I don't know. Um, and so, for example, and this is not, well, it's not meant to be a shameless plug, but it's an example. Um, Tiny Universes, which we published this year, it is a small book of flash fiction. 
um, of, you know, little pieces, often one page um, by Zach Murphy. And I've not seen, I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but obviously not that visible. I've never seen a flash fiction book um, or a small one, you know. Um, I know there's perhaps maybe one or two anthologies out there, but not many. And flash fiction's fantastic. Um, and it's it's also the sort of the intermediary uh, genres like I'm a huge advocate of prose poetry and the only prose poetry anthology I've seen is uh, came out I think last year by Valley Press which was fantastic um, and so we're very much uh, genre blending you know a bit a bit you know we're literary but not academic and it's it's the stuff you can kick back and perhaps read a couple of times over, you know in the evening and you know go on to the next one um we'd love to do bigger things um but 2020 kind of pushed that back a bit <laughs> like all right we're not ready for the stress of a bigger book just yet um we're only four years old and, and not even most of that was being as a publisher so we're still finding our feet in that department but yeah quirky unusual bucking the trend <laughs> and what about your audience, Hayley? Um, when you said they're mostly US, is that do you have lots of US authors or is that just because US people love your work? <laughs> I think it's the latter. Um, we do have uh, you know, US authors and, and I'd say I'm just having a look down here. Perhaps even 75%, maybe not even, maybe a little less, maybe 60%. I'm just looking, we've got a couple here. Um, but yeah, because they seem to be sending stuff into us. I'd love to publish more, you know, um, UK or even European authors. I think we've only got one European author, um, but they just don't send us stuff. And I'm like, send me stuff, please, from <laughs> other parts so we can be more diverse. We can embrace other cultures that we might not be so familiar with. Um, and I, it's, it's just how it's happened. Um, I need to get on my, my promoting game a bit more about, you know, you know, you can send us anything from anywhere in the world and, you know, we'll, you know, no matter how much the postage is, we'll make sure your, your books get to you as well. Um, and no, it's, it's just been organic like that. I don't know why particularly, but we just, this just seemed to be. Popular. You'll get some UK submissions now. So yes. <laughs> people are watching now, they'll send their work in. Yeah. Ready it down. Um, I think our audience, um, well, we want anyone to be our audience, actually. Um, I think we tend, I tend, to want to choose uh, books that are from women um, or feminist. Um, we have a lot of LGBTQ authors. Um, we write, we're now publishing um, some genre books, um, sci-fi, fantasy. Uh, one of our authors said, I want to go to FantasyCon, maybe since 2016 or 17 can I go? And I said, can you come and can I do my book launch there? I said, sure. And then I said, you know, Alan, I think we do have some sci-fi books. We've just been choosing good writing, things that keep me up at night, things I can't put down, things I find myself thinking about, things that I think I've seen on TV and I go, oh, it's that manuscript. And so I, we looked around and we had four or five books that would fit the sci-fi um, and fantasy genre. So off it went. So now we're actually doing more of that. We're actually getting a lot more into middle grade books and young adult books. And we started off, we've got, this is a young adult. I'm trying to think, what did I do with it? Somewhere at large, if we have a, we have children's picture books now. We're doing more middle grade books. We've had them read in schools because of lockdown. The teacher had to put the words up on a screen. And so the, the clear of uh, the class of a year six class likes, you know, they're on the back blurb now. So I think, I think mostly I'm just trying to choose writing that uh, appeals to us, but people that get to us are the folks who, who might not get selected by the big publishers who just keep choosing the same big names, John Grisham, you know, mostly men, you know, and so, so we do, we do end up with the manuscripts that end up with us because they aren't getting else in, in you know, getting into other places. Um, but yeah, I, so, and as far as the audience, I want everyone to read all of our books. I want them to go everywhere <laughs> all the time. And um, I'm really, I'm really kind of uh, psyched that one of our new writers will be Rebecca Smith, um, who did the, the Jane Austen Writers Club. So, so I was really oh. happy. We're doing our middle grade book, you know, and that's coming out. And so we're, we're starting to, to do that. And I think her blurb is written by Ali Sparks. And so we're just kind of doing things that are 
kind of moving up a little bit. And so that that gets more of our books into hands, like I said. And I I don't know. Um, everyone here will say this, I know, but your favorite moment really is when your author sees your book for their first time, isn't it? Isn't that it? The shiny book? The make it the whole. And so I'm only seeing that on Zoom now. I'm like, don't, don't open the box until you're on the camera. But it's it's always a really cool. That is so cool. I mean, I still have that, ah, you know, even when we look at our uh, you know, when, when a new book shows up and we've done a hundred books now, but um, I still love it. And then when they see it, I really love it. Yeah. I, I, I think one of the things that we're missing is if you like uh, writers from minority backgrounds. Yes. Well, we're working That's, on that, but yeah, we're working, well, we're working in on England, it, but it's, we're, in the we're, North we're not, we're yeah. not seeing enough mm. um, of those writers giving us material to look at. Well, actually, no, I have several from, I have two writers from Kenya right now, Alan, and I'm working with- that's two um, rather than 202. That's I know, I know, yeah. I know. The problem is, the problem is going to be trying to have them come here via Zoom to launch the book or do something like that. So yeah, that's so I guess like when we're thinking about that, because like, the next question I was going to ask, which Alan may know, that may be why he's thinking about it, is what you'd like to see more of uh, from people. So I guess for Stairwell, well, that might be, you know, you want to reach people from cultures all over the world, but also you were talking about young adults, like a growing market for you yes, um, yes. and sci-fi. So I guess that sort of um, every kind of background and reaching out into more communities is sort of your focus this year going forward. Oh, absolutely. I think really um, moving into more middle grade, my new Miss Lexia advertisement is all on just our, our middle grade books. Um, and uh, yeah, one child's book that's out, you know, yeah. Nice. What about you, Haley? What are you hoping to see more of this year or to do more of? Oh, we've, I've been reading a lot because we've had our open chat book submission for the last, um, how long now? six months I had to close it because we got too many to handle. six months a long time yeah yeah um I would love what would I love to see oh, I'm not too genre specific I've never been even as a reader I I drift between things so pinpointing that's really tough I'd love to see you know more minority writers as well uh, we don't we have a couple um, and considering we've got quite a small catalogue, you know, it's it's okay, but I'd love to see more. I'd love to, I'd love to see more um, bilingual um, creativity. Um, there's a brilliant writer and I will get her to pop send me something at some point um, <laughs> called, uh, is it Elizabeth Castello? Um, I've heard of her again. Lovely, lovely lady on Twitter. Absolute gem. She's got the most amazing hair, I have to say. Um, <laughs> And uh, just chatting with her through, uh, finding her through Mum Write, which is fantastic um, uh, workshops and publications run by Nikki Dudley for um, mums who want to write but have trouble finding the time. Um, and uh, she, we recently published some uh, poetry by her, which had um, language from her own background. Um, I want to say it was Italian, but I'm terrible sometimes with my memory um <laughs> and having that blend and I realize that's stuff you don't often see um I mean I'm my background is Welsh but I can't speak Welsh so whenever I I try and write in Welsh it's very difficult um but I love other languages so I'd love to see stuff that does that and tries to push that because I, I don't see much of that in in mainstream writing as well um what else would I love to see um more prose poetry I love prose poetry um it's <laughs> so good I uh, love uh Lydia Unsworth for anyone who wants to explore prose poetry uh Lydia Unsworth is a great one to to pursue um and and more experimental more visual poetry as well i love visual poetry like derek bewley um and i we don't get sent much of it but i'd love it i'd love to do an art book as well which would mm. kind of cross the boundaries between cool. visual poetry and everything i'd love to do that um like i'm, I'm just plugging people now like pentarac press um recently published one by james knight uh, which is just fantastic like photocopying um puts it through a formula and it spits out these images and it's really cool um so stuff like that I mean if it's good we don't we we haven't got a huge budget you know that that we don't but we 
have so much integrity that we will do whatever we can to make a book really shine um and so you know even if you think it's something oh no one's ever going to publish this because it's got so many color pages it's you know someone's going to look at it and think oh this is unaffordable people like us and similar small presses we we can take the time and you know okay we might have to perhaps do some kickstarting but we're willing to put the time in in order to see that book come to light and whereas a publisher would be like oh why why am I going to publish uh, you know a big publisher why am I going to publish something that has 50 color pages um which is going to cost us an awful lot more as opposed to this paperback that is just text you know it's it's that dynamic I really love in small presses that can do all those weird and wonderful things that just, people just don't often take the time over I want to ask one more question that links to that, Hayley, because I'm going to skip one so we've got a chance for audience questions. But because we were talking about money and obviously small presses, we have these big, wonderful ideas and we have big brains and we just want to do creative things. So if I gave you 50 grand and I said you can do whatever you want with it to develop an idea or the press, what would you do with it? Mm. See, I would. I, I was thinking that earlier. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I'd change that much because I I wouldn't want to take away what we were doing and what we're doing well. And I, you know, as much as I'd love 50 grand, I, I probably won't still get up my day job because I still have a mortgage. Um, but at the same time, I would probably then do things that would cost us a little more, like more anthologies, more perhaps um, charity focused books, like your wonderful um uh, World Wildlife Trust one you did I might have got that yeah, yeah no Planet in Peril yeah exactly yeah, Planet in Peril um, I thought that was such an inspiration um, and stuff like that where you've already got some of the backing to be able to do that I'd love to do and there was a wonderful book um, I can't remember the publisher now but it's by Lizzie Huxley Jones called I want to say it's called Stim and it's a book by disabled artists and writers and I would love to do something uh, that promotes disability and um, disabled writers work more because that's comes from my background. Um, I've got disabled family members and I've got um, friends up and down the spectrum. And I would love to have some money to really do something like that. That would be amazing. Um, and Lizzie had to like kickstart for about a year, took another year to get it published. Um, and you know, money, money does help with those kind of things. As much as I, I don't like being money minded and self coof, it does help. So fifty grand would be very nice. Thank you, please. I, mean, I would <laughs> love it. I would immediately give the wonderful interns that we have that have stuck with us and come back after school money. I would say Same. here is five or six thousand a year. I would get a shop front. I would have a small space. I would have art on the walls. We would have readings and book launches. We got a tiny micro grant when the when the lockdown first happened, and we wanted to do the look inside like they do on Scamazon, and we did that. But we got it done for a lot cheaper than we could have. And so with the rest of the money. I published geography is irrelevant which is true because with zoom geography is irrelevant and every single one of the authors got a free copy of the book whether they were in Australia or California and there we had a lot of for a change black voices and brown voices and they were in this book because we had people talking about black lives matters and the George Floyd murder murder here in this book coming from California coming from the states and so that was a really good thing that I was able to do with um with the money and it felt it felt really good. And Alan's like, well, I had to pay a little something. I'm like, no. So it was really good that we could do it and then send the copies out, you know, anywhere. And so I think with 50, I would definitely have more interns, living wage, an office that isn't this office, oh, and, office. and um, nice. you know, and, and <laughs> being able to do more and being able to do that book of photography that what we wanted to do a few years ago that never really quite got off the ground because I didn't get ACE funding for it, but it would have been, you know, seven or eight thousand and so I couldn't do it so um that would be fantastic I think it would it'd be fantastic I don't know yeah so like I told you when you said that question I was like well I've just spent the money <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say just a second that with because I've got um three wonderful volunteers uh Rebecca Steph and Katie and I'd love to pay them something because <laughs> they do work so yeah. hard and and they spend their own time um and you know, they, they wanted to join because they were wanting to learn new skills and they wanted the experience in that so they could then look at other jobs in publish public, public, publishing. 
Um, but yeah, if I could give them some money, I would because oh, they're stars, all of them. I, I think we we certainly, when um, authors' books have needed uh, attention, what we've often done is lined up a, um, a an intern with them and just said to the people, "You are, you know, pay these people something. They're going to help you. They're going to spend a lot of time. It's between you and them." Um, so yeah, we that, have done that. That's true. That's Our assistants do get that. That's really good. Yeah, it, it it takes it offline. We don't have to be quite so involved in the in the day to day of it because but they be also fun. learn um, how to work with an author. You know, they yeah. learn tact and and how to so have important. author's voice be yeah. really important. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think in one case we were struggling to get an author, an author to understand that something needed changing, and we sick them a, an intern on them, and magically <laughs> it, it happened. I remember that book. Yes. <laughs> no, no. An author struggling with something that needs changing—that doesn't sound likely at all. <laughs> oh, my favorite one is the manuscript that comes in final version, and you're like, "Oh, sweetheart, yeah, <laughs> aren't you sweet?" Final version seven. <laughs> yes, I mean, this particular um, uh, intern actually wrote a blog in entry and it included, you know, I expected to have a couple of runs through a manuscript, see how it goes, and then it will be finished. She says, by the time I'd finished the 12th reading. <laughs> and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an important thing about what we look at is if you think you can stand to read it 300 times, fine, it's a good book. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I feel like that's a very good benchmark for whether for whether something makes for good reading or not. I remember being in uh, in, in one of my MMA classes and uh, our lecturer saying in, you know, on average, you have to redraft your novel seven times. And that's after you get a publisher and everyone's faces just dropped. It's like, oh, why bother? <laughs> it's a horrible thing to hear. But often sometimes that's just like little things, just like tiny little things. One of We've my, got... one of my oh, favorite sorry. cautionary, oh, sorry, Isabel. Um, you are probably gonna steer us way towards where we should actually be rather than the cautionary tale that I was about to lead us down anyway. <laughs> so by all means, have at it. Hayley, I will DM you with my cautionary tale. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we get a few questions in because I know yes. some people might need to leave bang on seven, uh, which is now. So um, <laughs> the first question that we had from the audience is that as an MA creative, creative writing student, how might I know what route is best for me when trying to get published after graduation? So obviously we have indie presses, we have traditional agents or big publishing houses. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> she thinks she'll never make any money from writing regardless. I think you will, but <laughs> what's the best route um, and how can they try? Um, Come here, go. I'm going to do the sappy answer and say, go with your heart. Send the manuscript out. Um, you really want to have, oh, I hate this phrase, the elevator pitch. It just claws at me. But anyway, come up with a nice way of describing your book, um, your, your story, really. It's not a book yet, is it? Your story. So you say, this is about so-and-so, and then you send out a short letter, not a very long letter, but a short letter to a couple of, of small presses. Do that because agents are very busy. And unless it is something, well, do it, try it, you know, send it out. But um, in the end, uh, go to the small presses. And, you know, if you get into the big presses, that's fantastic. And I'd be really happy for you. But do send it to a small press and 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 research the small press and see what they tend to publish. And don't don't send out a letter to 75 or 80 small presses, all CC'd in the email, um, not even blind copied, just copied. And then call me, dear sir. And, um, don't do and, it. and yeah. I've had so many of those. Don't do that. Please don't do no. that. Please don't do that. Just, just go, hi, Rose. I've been looking on your website. And even if you haven't, lie to me. I won't know. And just, you know, and then just make it short and tell me why I would want to look at your book and send a chapter or two. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's one more thing here is that there is, this, that there is this feeling that all I have to do is to write it and send it away. And I try to think, make people think back to how writers had to work several hundred years ago. You know, you had to grind the gall to make the ink. You had to take pluck goose feathers to make the quill before you could even start. So there's a whole profession, a professional gambit around writing. And to my mind, that also includes learning how to use a word processor, learning how to use email, 
um, and not just assuming that they're just magic boxes that are going to make things work for you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because, I mean, I've, we've got on our site a thing called um, this Learn Your Own Word Process, Learn How to Use Your Word Process, which, which, which begins with that story. There are some things you can do to make life easier, both yourself and your publisher. Um, for example, if you use a serif font, you can make sure you have proper inverted commas and you know which way around they're pointing so that the publisher doesn't have to spend hours and hours going through your manuscript making the inverted commas face the right way around. There's, there's a whole lot of little things like that. Don't mix, don't mix tabs and spaces and indents at the beginning of paragraphs. It's really annoying. I mean, for me, it is very annoying because I have to clean that up afterwards. So, so, but there, there's a whole range of things which writers should be thinking about. Don't get to the next page by pressing enter, 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 enter till the page goes. Because in fact, different, you know, as soon as you send it to your publisher, the end of the page will be somewhere different because Word picks up the local printer and their local printer isn't your printer. So the print metrics on Word are different in diff on different computers. So there's a whole range of things, you know, learn how to do a new page. A lot of very simple things, but it actually makes life a lot easier and makes us feel a little bit nicer towards you when you see that we've, you've actually made a bit of an effort <laughs> to understand if you like the tools of the trade yeah first impressions are definitely key like don't put your email in comic sans don't do it don't do it no, i don't care how friendly it looks don't do you it always someone who hates comic sans yeah. <laughs> someone always well, so angry about it just, it's just i don't get angry about Why? it it's just like someone I looks down <laughs> yeah and well, i'm we, like you thought this was the best thing to impress me with, this Comic Sans? Well, you... we, we, we publish a literary journal that's been running for 20 years, and we've, we've learned as a rule of thumb, however, however much self-laudatory your intro letter is, it is likely that the material added is an absolute kibosh. Oh, it's the know? inverse, yes. The longer yes. the letter, yes, mm. that's true. Yeah, I know. Just introduce yourself <laughs> and give us some stuff. You know, if you, if you say, so-and-so loves my poetry and so-and-so loves my poetry, well, most of the so-and-sos are famous names and the best way to get you off their back is to tell you how wonderful you are. Ignore that. Don't, don't, don't get opinions from your family. Your family will never <laughs> criticise. You get, get your opinions and, and, you know, the people looking at your material is somebody else who is independent and who doesn't have a, a vested interest in being nice to you. We've got, um, so Mary, who runs Alchemy Spoon, uh, which is a new magazine. I think they're on issue three, but she can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, she's saying basically what, what the potential role in magazines helping small presses get the word out there and sort of more collaboration. So, for example, they review new titles from indie publishers. And maybe someone would like to send an essay into the magazine about the role of their small press. So there's opportunities there. Oh, I've already written in the, in the chat. Yes, Mary, I will. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, and Emily is saying, you know, I'm really pleased to see the costs of major awards because, mm. yeah, lots of writers don't realise that if you're part of an indie press, you might not be able to be entered into the Costa unless, you know, you're going to crowdfund and hope you get 25k. So, yeah, there's things like that to think about when you're submitting. Um, and Rose wants Claire HM's collection of non-standard English and dialect, <laughs> which sounds really cool. Um, I'm guessing there's some Brummie language in there. Um, but I don't know. Just um, to, to kind of like piggyback off that question, um, there are certainly um, indie presses who are already absolutely flying the flag for non-standard English and dialectal writing. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are a handful that could be brought up just kind of like off the, off the tops of everyone's heads. Um, but from kind of like close hand experience for myself and for Isabel actually Wild Press to have published both of us um have has also have all sorry put my teeth back in have also published RM Francis um who um has the most gloriously wonderful black country accent um which which leaks into his writing um so Bella um which came out I want to say last year but it may well have been the year before now because what is time in the time of covid um but there are whole chunks of bella written in um black country dialect um and it's 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 really really fascinating and wild press did wonders with it and i i believe he's got a second one coming out soon as well um called the renner um which is about growing up on on his estate in 
I want to say Dudley, there's probably fine fine lines and nuances about the geography of the Black Country that I may well have just I may well have just got wrong. Um, but yeah, so wild wild pressed for one, and Rose seems particularly fond of <laughs> fond of the idea of non-standard English and and dialectal English. Um, so there's there's definitely a place for it, I would say. I've got a book coming out eventually. We've been it's in process for the longest time. It's called Needleham and it and it is set in West Yorkshire and it has a lot of dialect in it. And it I think it's important. Um, I think Kate Fox and I have talked about this a lot about northern voices and where are they on the news? Mm -hmm. And you know, we and in America, the opposite, a southern, you know, a southern accent, just they they deduct IQ points when they hear me talk. So just go, oh, they just figure, you know, you don't know anything. And so I think that it's like anything else, the more it's out there, the more familiar it is, and the more familiar something is, the more accepted it is, and the more accepted it is, the more, and it's just a nice, it just goes around. It's a nice, oh, what's that word? Synergy, a word that's used a lot, but yeah. And then Brian is wondering, in terms of submissions, is there something that publishers don't want to see at the moment and why? And I put that in there. The book better pass the Bechdel test, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, don't want to see, I don't want to see a lot of women as victims. I don't want to see a lot of that sort of thing. I just don't. We won't publish it. No, I think it's very important to read your publisher's guidelines. They'll usually say what they're not keen on. Like for me, and this is this is just our personal taste as a press, we're not keen on stuff that's overly political, like hugely so, but depends on the politics. So that's kind of a, it depends, like eco-friendly, eco-worrying, yes, we do want that. A you know, 20 page rant about the UK government, maybe not. Um, and we have had those. Um, and uh, stuff that's overly religious, um, simply because I do not come from a religious background, I do not have the knowledge to to properly treat that novel with respect um as i say if if it's something is absolutely gorgeous i will go over those 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 um preconceptions if i think i can do justice to that book um but it feels disingenuous when i get something that is very um like biblical focused or in any other religion um that i I'm just not educated in. I need to educate myself and, I, and and that I'm working on, but I will not be able to do that justice to that book because I, I won't be able to care for it as, as someone who, who does have that background, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, definitely. I guess it's about, you know, it's again, finding the right home for your work, isn't it? So yeah. you're not looking for that, but there are publishers who, you know, uh, either like that is genuinely their faith led as a publisher. And there are some presses that are like that. Uh, certainly for the Northern Publishing Fair, there are some publishers, I want to say Chickpea Press, um, which are like specifically, you know, faith books um, and experimenting with faith in their work. So yeah, I mean, you know, if it's really centered, then you probably want to find a publisher that has the right audience so you do want that you do want that we have a book that's kind of spiritual as far as um saving the planet the Tao revolution so i'm really pleased with that we have actually published a book that was um talking about clifford's tower and the massacre of the jewish people there um and i should know 1190 or something and then he tied it to the martyrdom of a, of a catholic uh person in the time of king henry the eighth and this guy is an unabashed catholic writer and i had to keep ungodding the text because he would say and the one true faith i go not the one true faith it is to you the one true faith but it's not for sterile books so we kind of made it um uh, respectful but i wasn't going to have the book come across as about the only religion you know the one you know whatever i couldn't i couldn't do that because that's not all that's not true to us anyway and besides who no one has the one true religion sorry and so um so there's that. I, we don't. We won't publish necessarily mm -hmm. highly religious texts, but this guy had a certain. He was talking about that or the religious figure of Margaret Clitheroe, who died in New York in in 500 years ago, during uh, Queen Elizabeth's time. And again, he did a, a story of her life, but I was like I said, yeah. kind of degotting it as we went along. Yeah, so it's well, just a very you, good history. And yours truly had to do a lot of fact checking. I, <laughs> yes. I rewrote big chunks of it because yes. because it was a little. It, it, it was a. a, a he skirted around some issues and they, they had to be sorted. But in fact, what he's done is he's actually got a book which is a much more practical description of the life of Moira Clitheroe than the, yeah. the standard text who just quote the old 
the old and he got trial tra trial transcripts from 500 years ago. I don't know how he did that. So that was that became historically interesting, and then I was okay with yeah. that. But yeah, yeah. Example of like a like proper project. <laughs> Example of like one of the sort of more political books we've published is is Artificial Wilderness, which is all about animal sounds and how Ooh. human contact affects it. And it looks into um, references work by various sound artists, um, as well as um, I, don't, I think it does reference COVID a little bit, but not quite where it got in the swing. I think it was published just before because literally we were going to do an online launch, one of the few we've done. <laughs> and it had to get cancelled. Actually, it wasn't online at that time. It was in a, in America, and we were going to zoom in. It had to be cancelled. Um, and this is just like a, an essay um, with illustrations about different sounds and how it's worked into um, ecology as well as sound poetry. So that one I really like. That's an example. Something that's a good work in its own right, but subtle in its themes, but it's not too not too elitist, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you were saying that your work, you know, you want it to be accessible and mm -hmm. open to everyone. I that agree with you absolutely there. I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an academic, but I'm not necessarily an academic writer. And when I went to a very elitist school, but there you go. When I went there, but one of my professors goes, Rose, you write in a very popular style. And I said, are you saying I don't write in an academic style? And he just smiled benignly. Um, <laughs> you know, I just always pretend my father is reading some of my work and that he was a very clever man, and, but he doesn't have all the lingo. So I don't like to write in lingo. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we're not, we don't focus on that. You know, my academic writing goes somewhere. I'm an, I'm, I'm an anthropologist and I work with uh, skeletons. So I don't, you know, it's quite different from what we do in the book publishing. I've got one last question for you. Sorry, Alan, uh, but That's I'll let okay. you answer this one first. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, Emily wants to know, how do you, because Emily is a reviewer, uh, just uh, <laughs> she wants to know how do reviews uh, play a part in your marketing strategies? Do they? Um, how does it help? Um, how do you integrate in reviews into your marketing? I don't. I try. I, every time a book comes out, I try. Um, and we sometimes get a few. Um, we don't tend to have that many. And I think that's just meaning not being organized enough, if I'm perfectly honest. I need to get, get on that more. We but like to put quotes on covers if we can get them. I mean, that's really important. My favorite quote was from yeah. Faye Weldon, a delight. And I almost retitled the book, A Delight, says Faye Weldon, but I managed to hold back. And, um, and so, yes, it, we, it's, that is really hard to do. I really, uh, you have to have it ready far in advance to send it out and have someone yeah. take their time. So that, that is a bit tricky. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm focusing on it at the moment, like trying to have the book done like four months in advance. But, you know, it's something that I wouldn't have been able to do two years ago because, you know, you really have to think far in advance. And I think one thing for a small press, you know, like there are some reviewers um, like Emma who is fan will just get out in a month. But when you're looking at, you know, journals who say, uh, twice a year or something you know you have to think really far in advance and think right if I submit it now in March it might be there in December this year <laughs> that's what I have trouble with is long-term long-term stretch yeah. <laughs> well if the but, author is still revising I mean you yes. know that's one of the things that we tried to take advantage of with Covid because um, we, we did get a small grant um, to help us through and we spent some of it on getting a uh, a traditional publishing consultant to help us and, and I think one of the things he got right the way through to us is if you're going to go and get into broader distribution you have to have the book ready a long way before five months in advance he said time is your friend that was yes. that was the thing so that we, we haven't got there yet but we're working we're working on it we're at five weeks right Alan <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> not that bad not that bad but it's not five months in advance. I don't have cartons of books in the hallway five minutes in advance. Yeah. I just don't. I no, just I mean, she's sitting here tonight, but I was saying to Claire, let's get it in the bookseller, but it's four, you know, four months in advance. <laughs> so I'm like looking at the day like, but you know, you just try, don't you, as a small press. You just try to be on the same level in terms of your review schedules and things like that as others. And if you don't yeah. get it, you know what? We put a lot of heart into it. <laughs> it is it is true. I mean, Alan, you described it as a pyramid scheme, don't you? I mean, one book pays for the next book, which pays for the next book, which pays for the next book. Yeah. And so How you don't work. have the capital to have things in process six months in advance. Mm. Very true. 
But it, makes, it means that we're a little bit more nimble too, though. I mean, we can have something yeah. come out that is 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 relatively recent, like the, the Zoom book, you know, the one on poetry, open mics across the world. Yes, yeah, so there's me with a nice schedule when she turns up with this book. Tomorrow, please. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do our best. Um, I, I, I think the, the issue with reviewing, though, is actually getting reviewers um, and getting reviewers in the right place. Because I think you, took, you, you mentioned the, um, the bookseller, uh, Isabel. I think the only time we've done anything on the bookseller, we've got about 1,500 people suddenly tell us that we've got a manuscript you to publish. <laughs> so there, it, it's, it's a, you know, that's not the thing we want to get. We want to actually get readers. And yeah. I think that's that's the that's the, that's where the challenge is, and I think we should we, we need to find a way actually of trying to get the the larger and broader scheme papers and journals to actually review independent presses. Um, Not only even, that, they notoriously don't review books by women, Alan. It, the yes. Guardian themselves, someone did a you know statistically looked at what they've been reviewing. So I, you know, th th there needs to be a more concerted effort for, on, on our behalf to get the big, to get those big presses to actually look at the small press, to, to, to look at the small press output, and to actually give us a fair crack of that whip, because it nearly always is reviewing my my mate round the corner who lives in the block of flats above us, or his grandmother's great aunt's niece. You know that that's where all of that is coming from, and it, it it's frustrating. But I think that is probably uh, another problem for another panel event, um, given yeah. that we have um, rapidly touched our end point and gone cruising past it. Um, so before before we take up the entire publishing industry and uh, keep at it for the next hour, hour upon hour upon end, um, from sabotage and I'm and I'm sure from Isabel because I know that it was really important to her and as it was me that we could kind of get get an event together to kind of mark the book coming out in the world um a huge hearty thank you to every one of our panelists um and everyone who has come along to listen to our panelists um because it's been really nice just to kind of have a bit of a, a sit down conversation about independent publishing and what it looks like and what it what it may look like in the future um again to reiterate the book is available through the fly on the wall press website beautifully modeled by Haley. i can see that she's yeah there's there there she is <laughs> <laughs> so so the book um is available uh in the um youtube description when this video goes online any hour now um there will be information on all of our panelists um, but we will also put a little tweet thread together um, to direct you to their websites um, so you can have a little look at what it is that they're doing and what they're looking for. Um, Isabel, have I forgotten anything that is essential? Um, I don't think so. Just to submit to our lovely publishers. Uh, so Hayley wants people from the UK. <laughs> Both wants some more or Europe. <laughs> or Europe. We have a lot of America and Canada. We just need more of the world. <laughs> so yeah, I just want to say thank you everyone for listening and chatting about small presses with us this evening. And thanks for joining us, for Jack and Hayley and Alan and Rose. And it's lovely to catch up with you and just online. Thank you so much, guys, for hosting this event. It's been fantastic. Yeah, um, thank you. For anyone who is around the coming evenings, um, we've got Rose Condos, The Empathy Experiment, happening tomorrow, um, which has been completely reimagined um, from how it initially looked. Um, because when Rose wrote The Empathy Experiment, it was essentially a poetry show about how technology is changing the way we engage with each other for the worse. <laughs> and then um, COVID happened. So now the empathy experiment looks ever so slightly different to how it looked <laughs> pre-COVID because post-COVID we all actually need technology a lot more than we did so it's it's going to be a really really special i can say it's like a sabotage exclusive um so that that is tomorrow and tickets are still available for that tickets are free um so it would be really it would be really lovely to see you there um we have the mum um poem press anthology launch on wednesday although that is now sold out and we have the carcanet showcase on 
Thursday. Um, the fact that I'm remembering these things never ceases to amaze me. Um, so before I manage to forget something um, and have someone pull me up on it, um, a huge thank you again to everyone for being involved this evening. Um, I hope that you are taking away tons of useful information um, and I hope to see all of you at something very soon. Take well, care. Thank you. Thank you so Bye much, Charlie. Bye. Bye.